Hello marine biology students. In this video we're going to talk about cells that are able to do all of the functions of multicellular organisms while still being single-celled. We're going to talk about protists and fungi. While all of the multicellular organisms in the oceans are eukaryotic, there are many types of unicellular eukaryotic organisms as well. These unicellular eukaryotic organisms have great diversity in their shapes, behavior, and means of acquiring energy. Photosynthetic unicellular eukaryotes are called phytoplankton. One type of phytoplankton that we are going to discuss are the diatoms. As I had mentioned, they are photosynthetic and they're a yellowish-brownish color. When we look at their photosynthetic pigments, we see that they have chlorophylls A and C and carotenoids. Most land plants have chlorophylls A and B. These diatoms have a shell made out of silica. And that shell is called a frustule. Diatoms are among the most important primary producers on Earth. They perform a significant amount of photosynthesis that's occurring on the planet because so much of the surface of the planet is covered with ocean. While diatoms are not the only phytoplankton, in certain parts of the ocean, they are the most abundant and most important. These diatoms are mostly solitary. And unicellular. However, some can be colonial. Here we see a diagram of what a typical diatom looks like. There are two ends of the frustule, a larger valve and a smaller valve, or the upper and lower frustule. And I often think of these as looking a lot like a petri dish with a lid. Those two interlocking plates are held together, and within there we have the cytoplasm and the chloroplasts and the nucleus and the other cellular structures of the diatom cell. Remember, these diatoms are unicellular and eukaryotic. Now, around half of the 12,000 known species of diatoms are marine, and most of the marine diatoms are planktonic. You will occasionally find diatoms in freshwater environments as well, like rivers and lakes and ponds. As diatoms perform photosynthesis and generate excess photosynthetic product, they end up storing that excess energy in the form of oil, as opposed to, say, starch or other carbohydrates. And this oil aids in buoyancy. A phytoplankton wants to ensure that it remains floating in the surface so it can receive the amount of sun that it needs to continue photosynthesizing. When we look at the silica frustule of a diatom, there are tiny pores within their shell, and this allows gases and nutrients to exchange with the seawater through diffusion. Some diatoms produce a toxin known as domoic acid. And when these certain species of diatoms are in blue, that toxin can accumulate in the tissues of organisms that eat diatoms, such as shellfish and small fish. When larger organisms eat those smaller ones, they can become ill or even die.
from the accumulated toxin. If this occurs to a human, we call it amnesic shellfish poisoning, and it's not always fatal, but it can be, especially if untreated. Since diatoms are unicellular, they mainly reproduce. Bicellular division. This is a form of asexual reproduction, and in this type of reproduction, the two halves of the frustules separate, and each cell then generates a smaller frustule within whichever frustule was there. This means that one of the diatoms will end up being the same size as the original parent, but one of the diatoms will be smaller. When that smaller diatom divides, one of its offspring will be that smaller size, and then one of them will be even smaller. After cell division, the cell must secrete the other half of the frustule. And because of this, diatoms get smaller each time they reproduce or at least half of the offspring will always be smaller than that original parent cell. As these divisions continue, the population of diatoms get smaller and smaller until they reach a critical level. At that point, the diatoms need to restore to their normal size by reproducing sexually, where an egg and a sperm meet, and the resulting cell, known as an oxospore, grows to the size of a large diatom, and then the process of asexual reproduction can begin again. So here we see a diagram of diatom reproduction. That one diatom will split into two. Each of those will then replace the smaller internal frustule, and in that way, the diatoms as a population get smaller and smaller until sexual reproduction occurs. The formation of that oxospore will then allow that diatom to grow to full size again before it starts another series of divisions. As diatoms die, which they regularly do, their silica frustule will sink and settle down on the sea floor. Diatoms contribute to biogenous sediments. On the seafloor below them. And we call a sediment that is made primarily of diatom frustules, we call it a diatomaceous ooze. Now these layers of sediment will settle and eventually become rock. If this area of the seabed ends up being uplifted, the sediments from these ancient seabeds would be called diatomaceous earth. Now, diatomaceous earth is actually used in a variety of industrial processes by humans. These silica-based sediments have been used as a form of insect repellent for gardening. They have been used in pool filters. They have been used for beer clarification. And they've even been used as mild abrasives in toothpaste. This useful material came from these phytoplankton. The next category of phytoplankton that I'd like to discuss are marine dinoflagellates. So this is another very abundant category of phytoplankton. Like the diatoms, most dinoflagellates are photosynthetic. although some are able to ingest particles. The defining characteristics of dinoflagellates is that they have two flagella that are in grooves around their body. Each species has a particular shape, and that is reinforced by plates of cellulose. Some of these dinoflagellates are bioluminescent, And when they are blooming, they can end up causing waves and 
the surface of the water to glow a bright blue color during the evening. Here we see a microscopic image and also an artist's impression of what these dinoflagellates look like and the groove around their theca is where these flagella will be found. A specific type of dinoflagellate known as a zooxanthellae are important dinoflagellates that live in a symbiotic relationship with reef corals, some sea anemones, and other organisms as well. The hosts provide protection to these zooxanthellae. And the zooxanthellae in turn provide photosynthetic products to the hosts. In fact, many of these host organisms have little or no growth without zooxanthellae. Now you may have heard of a situation called coral bleaching. Coral bleaching is when these reef corals release the zooxanthellae symbionts that they had held inside of them out into the water. Now this can definitely impact, even kill some corals. So preventing coral bleaching, preventing this loss or expulsion of zooxanthellae is important. It's not known exactly what causes coral bleaching, but it does seem to be tied to increasing temperatures in certain regions. Diatoms and dinoflagellates can go through periods of rapid growth known as blooms. This is usually a result of high levels of nutrients in the water. This can come from upwelling or runoff or pollution. These blooms can be harmful. To marine organisms and even to humans at times. This is because toxins can accumulate in marine organisms which are consuming these algae and also following a algae bloom. Once the algae have died off, the bacteria in the water begin to break them down they can end up using the oxygen that's in the water. And so you can end up with very low levels of dissolved oxygen in water after a algal bloom. Some species can reproduce in large numbers and produce what's called red tides. These red tides can change the color of the water sometimes. And depending on the species of the algae, these could be considered a harmful algal bloom. A particular dinoflagellate that has been known to bloom is from the genus Fisteria. Fisteria is a dinoflagellate that produces very serious toxins and can cause massive fish kills, can also harm shellfish, and impair the nervous systems of humans. There are a few more groups of phytoplankton I would like to discuss. Next, we have the silicoflagellates. As their name suggests, silicoflagellates have a shell made out of silica and they have flagella of two varying lengths. You can see the star-shaped internal skeleton in this micrograph. Another type of phytoplankton are the coccolithophores. Coccolithophorids have calcium carbonate shells, so these ornate shells of calcium carbonate plates. And as you can see from this micrograph, each coccolithophore has several of these plates. As these coccolithophores die, these calcium carbonate plates sink and settle to the bottom, forming another type of biogenous sediment. In fact, as these calcium carbonate plates collect and settle, they form what we call chalk. 
And so chalk deposits that are harvested, whether for writing implement for a chalkboard or whether it's used for drywall, these are usually from ancient marine sediments that had accumulations of coccolithophoric plates. A famous example would be the White Cliffs of Dover in the UK. These white cliff sides are marine sediments that were made from coccolithophores. We've spent some time talking about photosynthetic microorganisms. Now we're going to talk about some microorganisms that act much more like animals, even though they are unicellular. The first of these that we'll discuss are the foraminiferans. or forams for short. Forams are exclusively marine, non-photosynthetic, meaning they are heterotrophs, or they have to consume food, thus making them animal-like. They have shells of calcium carbonate. Of these forams, many of them are benthic. However, some can be planktonic. Forams can end up being important contributors of calcareous materials on coral reefs or sandy beaches. Pseudopods or cytoplasmic extensions, they extend through pores in the shell where they are used to capture minute food particles such as phytoplankton or detritus in the water. Here we can see some photos of some forams, with the first being a planktonic example with its pseudopodes extending from its test, versus a cluster of red-colored benthic foraminifera as well. Like the diatoms and the coccolithophores, foraminifera can contribute to biogenous marine sediments. And we call these foraminiferin ooze, limestone. Is often uplifted marine sediments that had been formed by foraminifera in the past. The field of paleoclimatology. often uses foraminiferin shells or tests to answer questions of water column temperature from the distant past. The orientation or direction in which the planktonic foraminifera shells coil can give paleoclimatologists information about past temperatures. Isotope testing can also be done on these calcium carbonate tests to see which isotopes of oxygen were used in making these structures. Another animal-like planktonic member are the radiolarians. Radiolarians in a lot of ways are very similar to foraminifera, but they are described as being star-shaped. They usually have a circular central body with rays extending outwards. They are very round and circular. Unlike foraminifera, Radiolarians tests are made out of silica, like the diatoms. Yet, like forams, they use pseudopods that extend through the pores in their shell. And they use these pseudopods to capture minute food particles, such as phytoplankton and detritus. Another unicellular protist are the ciliates. So ciliates have hair like cilia for moving and for feeding. Most live as solitary cells, but some end up building shells made out of organic debris or sometimes even sand. Many of these ciliates live on hard substrates. yet some can be planktonic. We're almost at the end of our discussion of unicellular marine organisms, and so the last category I'd like to talk about are fungi. 
Fungi are abundant and ubiquitous on land, but it turns out that they are not as common in the marine environment. Like some of the protists we've talked about so far, fungi are eukaryotic. And most of them are multicellular. They are heterotrophic. Meaning they must consume organic molecules in order to get energy. And of the at least 1,500 species of marine fungi, most of them are microscopic. Like bacteria, many fungi break down dead organic matter into detritus. Another place that you'll find marine fungi is in the form of lichen that can be found usually in wave-splashed areas of rocky shores. A lichen is a symbiosis between fungi and cyanobacteria, or fungi and a form of algae. And we call this symbiosis a lichen. Marine lichens often live in wave splash areas of rocky shores and other hard substrates. I would like to end this video by drawing your attention to an important table that is in our textbook in Chapter 5. This table highlights the characteristics of the major marine microbes, providing information about their distinguishing features, uh, whether they are photosynthetic, in which photosynthetic pigments are present, where they get their food, how they store their energy, if they have a cell wall and what it's composed of, and also the role that it plays in their associated ecosystems. There's a lot of information here and it's far too small to see on this slide. I definitely encourage you to look at this table in the textbook as it does a great job of summarizing the information from this presentation. So that finishes our discussion on protists and fungi. Now, before our next video, I would like you to think, what does it take for something to be a plant? All right, see you in the next video.